Well, Happy New Year. It's, it's good to see all of you. We're going to be uh, in the Gospel of Luke again, Luke chapter 15. I would encourage you to turn there in your Bibles, if you would. If you're using the Pew Bible ahead of you, it's on page 874, Luke chapter 15. I would also encourage you that um, if you haven't already, please, please pick up a study guide. This will not only help you in kind of your own personal preparation for the study, but will just help you to maximize your time as we're going to be in the, these parables in Luke chapter 15 for the next several weeks. So beginning this morning and then working for the next uh, six weeks, we're going to be working through these parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin uh, this morning and next Sunday, and then spending four weeks in the parable of the prodigal son. Um, it is going to be, I think, a very rich study. I have been challenged and encouraged in my own preparation of this text, and, um, and I just want to encourage you to, to maximize your time, be in the Word, do a question a day so that you can kind of see where we are in preparing your own heart for what we're going to study as, uh, as we come together on Sunday mornings. Luke chapter 15. It begins this way in verse 1. It says this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. The longer we're in the scripture, in the gospel of Luke, I hope and trust, the the more your heart and your mind It is growing in affection for Jesus. We see again here in Luke chapter 15, beginning in this chapter in verses 1 and 2, we see Jesus' posture not only towards the tax collector and sinner, but also to the Pharisee. I've entitled this message, and forgive my lack of creativity, The Paradox of Jesus' Ministry. Paradox is that seeming contradiction. The the thing that that seems illogical and and perhaps a little perplexing on the surface, but at the heart of it, the truth of the matter is that which seems to contradict what is at the surface. This paradox that we're going to see about Jesus' ministry. Now, if if we had time this morning and I could address you, and we could just talk through this together. I could ask you a, the, the question, and I could get a response from you. I, I would ask this question, what is it about Jesus' ministry that seems so paradoxical, that seems so contradictory, that, that seems to be counterintuitive, as it were, as, as we see Jesus here in Luke 15, and the tax collectors and sinners are drawing near to him. Is it that Jesus, who is God in the flesh, holy and perfect, untainted by sin, seems to be drawing the very individuals who by nature have rebelled against God and and in their history at some point or the other have rebelled against him so much that they are classified and identified with these terms? How is it that those who are tainted, corrupted, polluted by sin, and and outcast from the community can find any level of acceptance and fellowship and, and even acquaintance with God himself. Just to remind us of the picture that the that those living in the first century Israel would have had about Jesus, we we need to think about the images about God from the Old Testament and seek to import them into this setting. So, just for a moment, to, to build some context for our study this morning, remember the prophet Isaiah. And remember there in Isaiah chapter six, when when he comes face to face with the majesty and the glory of this holy God. In Isaiah 6, 1 to 5, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. 
Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, this is Isaiah now speaking, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Who is this King of glory? The psalmist will say, as we saw in Psalm 24, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is this King of glory. Jesus is this King of glory. Jesus is the one high and lifted up. Jesus is the one on his throne. The train of his robe is filling the temple. Jesus is the one in this scene where the foundations are shaking and the air is reverberating with the sound of this seraphim who is calling forth from heaven, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This holy angel, elect angel, knows his place and covers his face in respect of God with his wings, covers his feet in respect of the glory of the Lord of hosts and shouts, glory and holy is this Lord King who is lifted up. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. Jesus will use Isaiah chapter 6 and apply this to his own life in ministry at the end of his public ministry in John chapter 12, verse 41, when he says this, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory speaking of himself and spoke about him. Isaiah saw the Lord of hosts, Jesus himself high and lifted up on the throne, majesty and glory, how easy is it for us, for us to forget as we come to the Christmas season, as we see the baby in the manger, to forget that Jesus, who was willing to associate and spend time with sinners, that, that he is this Lord of hosts, this King of glory, this Lord who is seated on his throne, who came to earth. The word of God made flesh and dwelt among his people. The one and the same. Jesus, the Lord of hosts, who walked among his people and called sinners to repentance. That is who we see today. And that's who we're going to be acquainted with even more as we begin to work our way through these parables and, and come to understand the shocking, counterintuitive paradox of Jesus' ministry. The Lord of hosts who has come near, who is holy and spending time with sinful people. We're going to be acquainted this, time, uh, this morning as we work our way through this passage is in, to, to three different groups of individuals. We're going to see it in verse 1. We're, we're going to come to understand these tax collectors and sinners, who, who they really are and, and why they were hated among the people of Israel. We're, we're going to come to understand the response of Jesus. They're drawing near to him, but how will Jesus, this holy God, respond to disobedient and willful sinners. And then finally, we'll come to the group of scribes and Pharisees, the religious elite, those who knew the law and revered the law and were, and were kind of the stewards, as it were, of the law of Moses and, and sought to, to, to help the people of the day to, to conform to that law and understand what that law required. We're going to see each of these groups and we're going to see the heart of Jesus shining through. So first of all, let's, let's draw our attention to verse one. Sinners draw near to him. Sinners draw near to him. Notice, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. This word drawing near is a Greek word that conveys the present continuous situation of their life. 
They're coming near. They're, they're drawing near. They're, they're approaching him. There was accessibility to Jesus. There, there was a, a, an acquaintance with him, a, a willingness of Jesus to, to allow them to, to kind of join in his, his circles in some way. The seeming contradiction is almost too hard to comprehend. How is it that Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who is perfect and holy and untainted by sin, fulfilling the Mosaic law in action, in word, in motive, in thought, in practice, in every way, that Jesus, this Jesus, who is holy, could associate with sinners? Every conception that the Jews living in first century would have of the of the image and character and identity of God would also have been known through the Old Testament and through the the temple itself. That is where the presence of God resided. And remember again from Psalm 24, the psalmist says, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who might stand in his holy place? And the immediate and automatic answer is nobody. Nobody has a right to stand in the presence of a holy God if they really come to understand and recognize uh, where they are in terms of their sin and rebellion against him. But the psalmist goes on, he says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who, who does not lift up his soul to an idol, who does not speak deceitfully, he will receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the one who will enjoy access to God. So the temple was this place of the presence of God, and it was a place of separation because only the priests could go into the temple, into the holy place, and only the high priest could once a year go behind the veil, that three to four inch thick fabric, that veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, could only enter into the real presence of God once a year on the day of atonement. This is the concept of God, the distinctiveness, the separation, the holiness of God that the people of Israel were so acquainted with. How is it that this God, who had been distinct from sinners and perfect in holiness could mingle with traitors of men and rebels of God. The seeming contradiction was almost too hard to believe. So we come to the tax collectors and and just to fill out our understanding of, of these categories of sinners that are presented to us, the tax collectors will begin with. Who were these tax collectors? They were considered traitors against Israel in every way. They had essentially turned their back on their own people. Of course, this was a strategic position from the Roman Empire because Rome, in that they were essentially inaccessible to the people and, and, and there was this cultural language barrier that separated them from the people, they employed from among the Jews, from among these nations, people from within them who knew the communities, who knew the cultures, who knew the families, who knew the occupations of of everyone in that community and could do the bidding of Rome in order to gather the taxes. These tax collectors essentially betrayed their own people to turn a profit, collecting hard-earned money from their countrymen and handing it over to the oppressor, to the occupier, Two words, even in our own culture, oppressor and occupier that, 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 that bring emotion to the surface. This is the same kind of feelings that they would have had against these tax collectors. Rome was not only the enemy. They were those who had dominating authority and leadership everywhere the people of Israel would go. Facing taxation, facing registration, as we saw in the early stories of Jesus, Mary and Joseph needed to go to Bethlehem to be registered, regulating travel and trade, limiting the expression of Jewish authority, especially as it related to capital punishment, so that no capital punishment could happen in Israel, independent of the approval of the Roman authorities. So the tax collector was a traitor in every sense of the word seen as aligning themselves against their own heritage, their own people. In every case, their position was given to them so they could gain personal advantage. 
demanding more than what was required, just because they could, exploiting God's people. Tax collectors would have been understood as coming against the Abrahamic covenant. You know how it goes, where God comes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. He says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And so these tax collectors, in coming against God's people, in coming against the heritage of this Abrahamic covenant, in cursing God's people, would have been cursed themselves, denying their heritage, thus establishing themselves as cursed for themselves, considered unfit to worship in the temple, unable to socialize with God's people, estranged from God's community, giving their allegiance to pagan, idolatrous Rome, and thus considered as one who has abandoned God in totality, turning his back on his people, turning his back on his heritage, turning his back on his religion, and turning his back on God, having nothing to do with them so they could turn a profit for themselves, spending their income on riotous living, Indulging in the flesh, pursuing lavish comforts by laying up treasures on earth and not laying up treasures in heaven. The very things that Jesus had confronted and rebuked, these tax collectors embodied in every way. So they were despised by the people. And the assumption was they were also despised by God. In the minds of many, they were considered irredeemable. Then we come to sinners. The sinners, this is the Greek word, hamartalos. It's the word that's often associated with tax collectors throughout the synoptic gospels. As a matter of fact, nine times in the synoptic gospels we find this phrase, tax collectors and sinners. So they essentially go hand in hand. When you talk about a tax collector, you're talking about a sinner. And you're talking about a sinner, they're no better than a tax collector. Those who have betrayed God's people and turned their back on them by profiting for themselves as the tax collectors would do were no better than those who were sinners who turned their back on God by sinning in some terrible way and thus abandoning all the promises that God had given to his people through the Mosaic law. Their position as sinners was considered the dregs of society. They were considered the scum of the earth. They were considered untouchable in every way. They were considered as well as irredeemable. So far spent in their depravity, they almost had no hope of finding their way back to God, of climbing that ladder of religiosity and duty and devotion to God in order to get get back to the starting point. In the Jewish system of thought, at least during first century Israel, the road to God was accomplished through religious duty. Clean hands and a pure heart that we saw in Psalm 24. Absolute dedication, consistent conformity, a life of faithful devotion. And so if one walked the road in the opposite direction from God, if they had committed sins of extreme rebellion against him, then their hope of finding God was virtually lost. They could never be seen as a true citizen of Israel, again, a a true partner in this Abrahamic covenant. But they must also always see themselves as, as having this slavish obligation to God and duty to perform so they could get their way back to the starting point. Back to God's good graces. In the Jewish religious system of the day, it was hard enough to find blessing from God if you didn't have this in the rearview mirror, some terrible sin in the rearview mirror. So if you had sin in your life, it was almost hopeless to find your way back. Sin, this big, was a deal breaker. Imagine a race. Those of you who have ever run in track or run in cross country, those of you who have been adventurous enough to run a marathon or a half marathon will know that in order to win a marathon, you need to run according to the rules. You need to stay on the right track. You can't deviate from the track in any way or you have no hope of making it to the finish line before the other people. Imagine running this marathon 
and you happen to find yourself running in the wrong direction, and you don't find out until an hour goes by. And by the way, I think there was a marathon that was just done recently in about two hours and 13 minutes, and, and, and some of the best are, are even below two hours. And so an hour has gone by. This person, in realizing it, may, may, may give up altogether. They may, they may decide, I'm going to try to turn around and, and just eventually get themselves to the starting line, let alone finishing the race. The same kind of concept as those who were tax collectors and sinners. The hope of ever working your way back to God, finding your way back, getting to the starting point, that that was the the, the best possible scenario. But verse one describes the scene that is completely unexpected. It takes your breath away. Notice, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus. Jesus all drawing near to him. Jesus receives and eats with sinners. That's the, that's the, the criticism of the Pharisees in verse 2. The Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. These may be the most beautiful words of our passage this morning. This may be the most beautiful words of the scripture. Jesus, friend of sinners. Jesus receives them. Jesus eats with them. The the word receive is to accept or to welcome. It's a compound word that that strengthens the the invitation that they're coming to. There's this directional component of coming to him and, and this welcoming environment that they're met with. And Jesus eats with them. Not just a casual association, but fellowship, a shared meal, a friendship, a measure of acceptance at a deeper level. They are experiencing and enjoying Jesus, not just at a, at a casual level, but, but the intimacy of fellowship that happens at, a, at mealtime. In that culture, this would have been tantamount to agreement and validation in the minds of the Pharisees. You, you didn't associate with these kinds of people They were unclean. To be in the same vicinity would mar your reputation, your standing in the community, would associate you as as one who is participating in the same kind of activity. It's not clear that Jesus was actually having a meal with tax collectors and sinners in this passage, in this immediate passage, but it's clear that the history of Jesus' ministry is that he welcomed them and ate with them throughout his ministry. We find in Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32, I would encourage you to turn back there with me towards the the beginning of Luke. This is Jesus having just healed a paralytic. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 27, and he leaves that home, and he comes and encounters this tax collector. Notice what happens. After this, he went out, speaking of Jesus, and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And uh, leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And the Lord made, uh, and, and uh, Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table. And the Pharisee and the, their scribes grumbled, mark that word, underline that word. It's the same word we find in our text this morning. Grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. You see, in first century culture, Eating meals together was a a means of networking. It was a a means of posturing. It was a means of of gaining access to individuals and and, and putting them in a place of of having to to pay you back in the future, Uh, of allowing those who lived in that community to know the the folks that you hobnob with, the the, the circles in which you run, the, the people in which you associate with. But Jesus, he didn't just eat with tax collectors. Jesus ups the ante and invites a tax collector into his inner circle. Follow me, Levi. 
to be a disciple, to enjoy the most intimate relationship a person could enjoy, of having close fellowship, to be an actual disciple of Christ. But this was the normal posture of Jesus' ministry. We see at the outset, going all the way back to Luke chapter four, this is how Jesus operated. He had ministry among the people. Jesus, in Luke chapter four, verses 18 and 19, says this about himself. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came for the broken. Jesus came for those who were neglected and despised, those who were outcast from society. Jesus came to the untouchable, to the unclean. We find this ministry that that touched those who were held at a distance from culture. Jesus is touching the lepers, something that in Old Testament law would have tarnished and polluted and made that individual unclean. Jesus touches the lepers and makes them clean. The demon possessed are in his company and and rather than these demons polluting and tainting the Savior, Jesus casts those demons out and purifies those who've been tainted from the deepest levels. This woman with an issue of blood who comes, reaches out and touches Jesus' garment. Something that in the Old Testament law, anything that would touch something that a woman with this flow of blood would have touched would have been considered unclean. But Jesus, instead of becoming unclean, cleanses her through the power of the Holy Spirit. This dead daughters and dead sons that Jesus is touching these corpses in Old Testament law. It was forbidden because it would make you unclean. Jesus touches dead bodies, not only cleanses them, but raises them to life. The Syrio-Phoenician woman who comes to Jesus and mixing it up with Gentiles, Jesus is not unclean by her, but comes and helps her daughter who is demon-possessed. And then we have the low-life Samaritans, Jesus trekking through Samaria and ministering to those who were there. He had a ministry that interacted with the untouchables of society. But rather than being tarnished and polluted by them, Jesus cleanses them and makes them clean. Somehow, Jesus saw things differently. Somehow, restoration would come instantaneously rather than having to work things out for yourself and become a slave to the law, as it were. Jesus was able to forgive sinners and and place them at the beginning of the line. Immediately, forgiveness would happen. Jesus would give them a fresh start. This oppressive system of religious duty that was defended by the scribes and Pharisees was abolished by the ministry of Jesus Christ a system that was devised by a man, but not from God. Who was this man who seemed to allow sinners to skip to the front of the line? That perhaps is what drew sinners to Jesus and certainly what made the Pharisees resent and hate him all the more. Now we turn our attention to the religious leaders, these scribes and the Pharisees who grumbled about him. We see them in verse two. It says, and the the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Scribes and the Pharisees believed themselves not only to be the defenders of tradition of the Mosaic law, but they saw themselves as the embodiment or the example of those who did it best. And here we come to their criticism their grumbling heart. They throw an accusation about Jesus that is meant to tarnish his reputation and invalidate his ministry. He spends time with sinners, he receives them, and he eats with them. Can you believe it? That was their criticism. The scribes were the chief architects of the popular Judaism in that generation. They exercised their influence primarily in the synagogues. The scribes were professional copiers, editors, and interpreters of the law. They were also the main custodians of the various traditions governed by the law. Most scribes were themselves Pharisees of heart, 
but they were those who saw themselves as defending the law. The Pharisees were legalistic, believing that the way to gain favor with God was by earning merit. These externals that they would perform and they would do in public so that everyone could see. Things like tithing the mint in the rue, of separating various seeds of the, of the spices that they had to, to show how, how eager they were, as zealous they were to keep the law. But in their heart, Jesus knew otherwise. Jesus knew it was just a show. He confronted them as being whitewashed tombs. He confronted them as having a cup on the outside that was clean, but the inside was full of wickedness and evil. The Pharisees were hypocritical. They fastened their hope on the externals. In the public, while they, while they valued this display of religion, Jesus confronts it both privately and publicly. We see this in Luke chapter 11, all the way through Luke chapter 14, where, where, where Jesus is confronting the Pharisees head on. If you turn to Luke 11 for just a moment, we can kind of catch a glimpse of this in verses 37 to 39. Jesus was speaking, and a Pharisee asked him to dinner. He went in and reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. Again, preoccupied with the externals. And the Lord says to him, Now you, Pharisee, cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. And for the next several verses, he goes on to recount the true nature of their heart in their rebellion against God. So that in Luke chapter 11, verses 53 and 54, we see the response. As he went away, speaking of Jesus from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. Jesus rebukes their hypocrisy. Jesus confronts the true nature of their heart. Jesus will show them through his life what God had come to do, and they see it for themselves, and the testimony of God being worked out in front of them through the miracles and the signs that he will do, and the posture of their heart is to grumble. This word grumble is the word, is a word uh, that is anmanapia, and onomatopoeia is essentially a word that sounds like the sound, the, the grumbling that is happening. It's the word that we find repeatedly throughout the Gospel of Luke to describe the, the nature and response of the Pharisees to Jesus' ministry. It, it is also the word that we find in the Old Testament translation of the Hebrew, the Septuagint, which speaks about the Pharisees' forefathers who are coming out of Egypt in the wilderness, and what did they do? Time and time and time again, they grumbled. Their grumbling hearts were emblematic of their forefathers who also grumbled against God in the wilderness, and because of their grumbling, they missed the promise, the promised land. And that leads us to what we see next, not only their criticism, but also their condemnation. You see, the grumbling hearts of the Pharisees not only blocked them from being able to enjoy this fellowship with God in this situation, but their grumbling hearts of the Pharisees led to virtually missing God altogether. They missed forgiveness. That's what we see in Luke chapter 5, verse 17 where the paralytic is let down through the roof by his four friends, and Jesus says to this paralytic, your sins are forgiven you. We find in verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to question their grumbling in their hearts. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive but God alone? Exactly, and he's there. And you're missing him because of your grumbling hearts have carried you away. They're blinding you to the reality of the nature of Jesus, the Lord of hosts, who is standing in your midst. Their grumbling hearts caused them to miss fellowship. 
As we saw in Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 30, this dinner that was taking place at Levi's house, somehow they're also in the company, but their grumbling hearts are keeping them from fellowshipping with this company of sinners that included them, but they separated themselves because of their grumbling hearts. It kept them from fellowship. We find in Luke chapter 6, their grumbling heart kept them from freedom. In Luke chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, on a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some of the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Because of their ideas and preoccupation with the Mosaic law, their self Uh, proclaimed uh, rules and laws that they had about the Sabbath. They could not enjoy the freedom that God had given in that day. They missed freedom. And they also missed faith. In Luke chapter 6, verses 6 to 11, on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue, was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. But they were filled with fury and disgust with one another what might they might do to Jesus. And then in Luke chapter 11, they missed God himself. They missed salvation. In Luke chapter 11, verses 14 to 17, he was casting out demons, this demon-possessed man who was mute and Remember, the Pharisees grumbled in their hearts and accused Jesus of casting out a demon by the power of Beelzebul. And Jesus says to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste. And a divided household falls. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Their grumbling hearts kept them from salvation. They could not see God. Their grumbling hearts condemned them just like their forefathers, so they missed the gift of God's goodness in coming through his son. They could not experience it. They could not enjoy it. They could not have it. And their grumbling hearts provide a warning for us. The the chances are, if you consistently have a grumbling heart, you share the heart of a Pharisee. May this be a warning. And it kept the Pharisees from fellowship with God. And it kept the Pharisees from fellowship with God's people. Grumbling hearts in the Bible are always set against the work of God. Warning. So where are we this morning? Where are you this morning? Are you in need of a friend to sinners? Has Jesus a friend that you need this morning. Have you come to a place of recognizing that because of your sin, you can find reception with Jesus? And by the way, I want you to understand that that in our text this morning, while they're called tax collectors and sinners, it was something that was in the past, and because of, of this terrible sin that was perceived by the people of the day as being disqualifying, they forever carried that title regardless of the turn of their heart. And so next week, when we come to the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, we're gonna recognize that the quality that Jesus is describing as repentance in bringing these sinners to Jesus. That is why they're there, because they recognize their sin, they have come to Christ and have found reception with him because they've come to terms with how sin has kept them from God. Make no mistake, Jesus is a friend of sinners because he delights in forgiving sin. James chapter four, verses eight and 10, use this same word, drawing near, that we find now twice in verse eight. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That is what we find in our text. We find 
these individuals who come to terms with their sin, they, they, they know where their standing really is in relationship to God. They do not deserve God's favor or acceptance. And they're drawing near anyway because they find in Jesus someone who is willing to forgive sins and put them in a standing with God they can't have on their own because they know they'll never have clean hands. They know they'll never have that pure heart. But only from God can they enjoy the benefits of what Jesus has to give. And in drawing near to God, God draws near to us. He will draw near to those who draw near to him. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. If you're in need of a friend this morning, if you're in need of a savior this morning, if you're in need of one who alone can forgive sins and can unburden your heart and your life with the weighing down of those sins that, that seem so insurmountable, the testimony of the tax collectors and sinners is no sin can take you too far. Jesus has come to save sinners, the ultimate sinner. Tax collectors and sinners, Jesus has come to rescue. Will you this morning bow your heart in repentance to the Lord of hosts, to the Holy One, and enjoy the rescue that he will give? For the rest of us who who have already come to a place of of essentially giving Christ our life and, and asking him to be our savior. There is this continual process that, that we need to go through of, uh, of daily coming to terms and examining our life and, and coming to a place of, of asking forgiveness for our sin again so we can be restored back to intimate fellowship with him. Are you drawing near to God? Might 2024 be the year that you experience the presence of God like never before as you're drawing near to him and you're actively, deliberately, intentionally, strategically drawing near to him. What might that look like? What do you need to do this year to to help ensure that, that you're being strategic and deliberate about drawing near to him so you can enjoy the presence of God like never before? How might that impact the way that you spend time with the Lord in prayer? How might that affect the way that you spend time with the Lord in his word? And as you evaluate your calendar, what are those things that continue to get in the way? What are those sins that continue to trip you up? You fall flat on your face. You, you feel uh, uh, like you have abandoned God and, and, and you feel this, this, this isolation from him because of your sin that keeps getting in the way. How might you ready your heart and draw near to God by asking for accountability, asking for forgiveness, and strategically finding ways to kill your sin? I, I love the statement of the theologian that says, Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Are you actively and deliberately putting sin to death in your life? And then there are the sins of neglect that happen because we are busy, busy people. Or you might say we are really, really distracted people. What are those things that are distracting you? from pressing in and drawing near and and enjoying the fellowship of God. As we draw near, he'll draw back, draw near to you. How is social media killing your drawing near to God? How is your screen time? If any of you are getting those screen time reports on a weekly basis, how are those screen time reports helping you self-reflect and know where you're spending your time away from God? How, how How are those leisurely kinds of things that aren't necessarily bad, robbing you of your time with the Lord. The the Apostle Paul says, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. How are we redeeming the precious time that God has given so that we can enjoy fellowship with him and intimacy and drawing near? May we, this year, experience the presence of God in our life like never before. Because the promise is this. The promise 
is that there will be reciprocal interest on God's part as we are pressing into him. He delights in enjoying fellowship with us. Let me close with this verse found in 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says this, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Fellowship with God is not just individual. We live in this individualistic uh, society where we feel like we can have fellowship with God independent of everyone else. But notice what this verse says, that fellowship with God happens as we enjoy, maybe magnified as we enjoy fellowship with one another. Prioritize the fellowship. Prioritize the community of God's people. May we enjoy the presence of God for us and through us this year and call others to enjoy it as well. Oh God, we praise you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you that he is a friend of sinners. God, as we begin this year, may we come to a place of recognizing our own unworthiness and we run to you to find all of the worthiness we need We need that is found in Jesus, your righteousness that's given to us through faith in Christ. And if anyone here this morning does not know Jesus as their Savior, Lord, I pray that even now they would do business with you, that they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so they can be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.